Good to see you. See you sitting among the constellation of all these Jays. Janie, John, another Jose, and one C, Catherine. And yet another Jose from the Secretariat. But let me come to the agenda. Let's choose. I receive a lecture from you. Special thanks are due to the Progress Report's lead authors, expert Jenny Lassimbang and John Henriksen, for their detailed, analytical, and useful work. Thanks also to Special Rapporteur James Anaya and the Secretariat for the respective contributions. We wish to restrict our intervention to more four major areas concerning the right to participate in decision-making of Indigenous peoples. These occur in the study, although we believe the deeper focus can be given. We hope, therefore, that our views will be considered for inclusion in the final report. These four areas are Indigenous people's role in, one, the national constitution-making process, two, the electoral process, three, through their own traditional and other institutions, as well as in, quote-unquote, hybrid Indigenous, non-Indigenous institutions, and four, state executive support for the aforesaid three types of roles. We reiterate that these decision-making rights emanate from that most important collective right, the right of self-determination of peoples, which right applies equally to indigenous peoples. History shows that most indigenous peoples worldwide were denied a role in national constitution-making. This is actually a major distinguishing feature of indigenous peoples worldwide. The only exceptions to this, as we know, are recent developments in some countries in Latin America and in Nepal. Let us compare the modern nation state to a house. Let us also consider the concerned national constitution of the state as the architectural plan. Now, if we are to add new rooms to such a house, rooms suitable for us indigenous peoples, we can only do that if the existing plan can accommodate the new rooms. Otherwise, we will only be at best moving the furniture around in the house, but remaining without a room and a bed. Well, we have been sleeping on the verandas and in shacks outside the main house for centuries. Thus, it is vital that indigenous peoples are provided fair and substantive opportunity to help rewrite the national constitutions with guidance from the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other international human rights norms and standards. We eagerly wait to see the developments in Nepal where they are drafting a new constitution. Let me now turn to the indigenous peoples' role in the electoral process. Although some advances have been made in a few countries, they are an equal number or even larger number of situations where their role has actually decreased. This is largely because of the prevalence of majoritarian orientation of political parties' priorities and the domination of money, muscle and numbers. Even where they are elected, indigenous persons are often subjected to pressure from party hierarchies and prevented from playing a substantive role in decision making. This has even happened in countries with large indigenous populations, including Nepal and Malaysia. It is therefore crucial that safeguards for indigenous participation, including through reserved seats in elective institutions, are introduced, or if they exist, are retained and strengthened. There are many workable examples in a few countries, although, such as in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and in Northeast India. Now, in the countries where indigenous peoples, traditional and other institutions have been, and continue to remain de-recognized by the state. The situation of marginality in decision makers is even sharper, such as in several parts of South, Southeast and East Asia. This is all the more so due to the problems inherent in indirect representative democracy. It is therefore vital that traditional and other non-elected indigenous structures be formally recognized in mainstream local and national decision-making processes, in addition to providing appropriate avenues for electoral representation in context-specific, democratic, rather than majoritarian ways. Finally, we feel that it is extremely important to ensure that indigenous leaders and other representatives' roles in their internal decision-making processes and in non-internal institutions and processes, such as referred to by the representative of Norway, uh, Denmark, I'm sorry, have the full and formal support of the legislative, judicial and executive arms of the governments of the states in which they live. In other words, these decisions must have teeth. The precondition here should be that the right and principle of free, prior and informed consent is fully adhered to within the spirit of the right of self-determination. Thank you, Chairperson.